Hello, Pirates and Poindexters. My name is TV Skyne, and controversial hot take, but I think One Piece is good, actually. It's not exactly a minority opinion, and if you're an anime fan who isn't into One Piece, you would be forgiven if you're sick of hearing it by now, but I genuinely, honestly believe that this comic is one of the great works of literature of the 21st century, wanky as it sounds. Like most good things, though, One Piece wasn't a stone-cold masterpiece right out of the gate, and it certainly has had its rough spots. Sanji spending the time skip on the island of predatory transphobic stereotypes, for example, was a low point for the series, and for all that Ichiro Oda can be a wildly imaginative master of character design, the man does struggle somewhat to come up with more than, like, one and a half distinct ideas for what his female protagonists can look like. Another part of One Piece that is less than perfect is its early story arcs. They tend to be compelling and fast-paced when you're reading them, but rough around the edges both in terms of their artwork and their storytelling. And while the early chapters have their share of iconic moments, discussions of One Piece's real high points tend to bias towards the Water 7, Eni's Lobby, Marine Fort, and more recently Wano Country arcs. Which is understandable, of course. First of all, because the earliest chapters of One Piece are a quarter of a century old by now, not a lot of people people go around remembering them, and second, because Oda and his team have gotten better over time, like anyone would when doing anything for that long. But what if I were to tell you that in one of the earliest parts of One Piece, which has scuffed art, clunky and poorly paced storytelling, and whose villain is so unmemorable, Oda has never bothered to bring him back in 25 years even for a passing reference or an easter egg? What if I were to tell you that in that arc, you can actually find not only the beginning of One Piece's most important themes and ideas, but a genuinely brilliant example of visual storytelling through character design. Would you be interested in hearing something about that? Well, grab a snack and settle in, because we're gonna talk about... The Syrup Village arc is perhaps better known as the story where they recruit Usopp and get the going merry. And just so as we're all on the same page, let's start with a quick recap of the plot. Structurally, it very much mirrors both the previous arc, Orange Town, where they fought Buggy, and many future One Piece story arcs, in that it opens with the Straw Hats arriving somewhere, they find that some likable people in that place are being menaced by bad guys, they beat up the bad guys and save the day, and then they sail off into the horizon with new fond memories and a fond hope of a reunion someday. It's a structure that One Piece uses a lot, because it is almost perfect for the kind of episodic adventure story that it is telling. So in this instance, the Straw Hats arrive at Syrup Village, a peaceful little backwater a town in the middle of nowhere. There, they meet Usopp, a talented sharpshooter and incredibly bad liar who likes to play a crying wolf game. He runs through the village every morning shouting, the pirates are coming, just to liven the place up a little and entertain himself, much to the annoyance of the villagers. The Straw Hats make fast friends with Usopp and his crew, who tell him about Kaya, a sickly but rich young woman who lives in the big mansion outside of town. If the Straw Hats are looking for a real ship, she would be the only one in the village who could give them one. But Kaya is also an orphan, and she's battling a bad, wasting disease, and generally leads kind of a sad and lonely life. So Usopp goes to the mansion regularly, sneaks in, and chats with Kaya and tells her outrageous but entertaining stories and lies, which has made the two of them very good friends. He is one of the few highlights of her otherwise dull and lonely days. This is where we meet Kaya's black-clad and uptight butler, Klador, who insists that Kaya should not see Usopp because it's not proper for her to be seen associating with a known liar, and he seems to go rather out of his way to keep Kaya isolated and apart from the people of the village. He's hired armed guards for the mansion, and he justifies it all by saying he's only protecting her delicate constitution. Clador also has a pair of glasses that don't quite fit him, and he keeps pushing them back into place with his palms, which, huh, what an odd habit. Clador catches Usopp talking to Kaya and provokes him by talking sh about his father. Specifically, he taunts Usopp by saying, you lie about everything else, why not lie about your worthless family too? The provocation works, and Usopp delivers what is, in the manga, a genuinely amazingly well-drawn punch to Klador's face. Like, I mean, let's just look at this line of action here, like the way the strap of the satchel leads into the arm, the foreshortening on the leg, and the way that the momentum, like, carries through the motion. Like, ah, that's just a damn good drawing. It doesn't look as good in the anime, unfortunately, but uh, anyway. Having successfully driven away Usopp, Klahador returns to his duties, and Kaya confronts him a little bit in the aftermath, asking him why he always drives away her friends and then makes her feel guilty about having them. 
Clarado responds to this with a bit of a sob story. You see, three years ago, Kaya's parents rescued him when he was at the brink of starvation and took him in, and now that Kaya is an orphan, why, he's just so concerned about her health and well-being, he can't stand the thought that anything should happen to her, or that a ruffian like Usopp might hurt her. He's only acting out of a concern for her well-being, you see. And Kaya, being the kind soul that she is, accepts this explanation. A little later, Usopp has gone to cool off in his favorite lookout spot over the sea and Luffy is there chatting with him. It turns out that Luffy knows Usopp's dad because, wow, it's a small ocean here, I guess. By coincidence, though, the two of them also happen to overhear Clahador meeting with an old associate named Django. In a flurry of rather poorly constructed exposition, Django tells Clahador a lot of things that they both already know out loud so it can be overheard. He reveals that Clahador is in fact the dread pirate Captain Kuro, who has been faking his identity for three years in order to have Kaya murdered and inherit all of her money. By acquiring her money legitimately in this way, Kuro hopes to leave his pirate identity behind and live a life of wealth and comfort. Usopp and Luffy are spotted because Luffy stands up and shouts at them, and Django makes Luffy fall off of a cliff by hypnotizing him. Presuming that Luffy is dead, Kuro lets Usopp run away, confident in the knowledge that nobody would ever believe the village's biggest liar over the nice and upstanding respectable butler that he has spent three years pretending to be. And it seems he's right about that too. Nobody, even including Kaya herself, believes Usopp when this time he tells the truth that the pirates are coming and that the village is in danger. They even attack him when he tries to get Kaya to safety. Dejected and injured, Usopp retreats to a lonely beach and declares that if no one else believes him, then he'll defend the village from the attack himself if he has to. That show of courage and willpower earns the Straw Hats respect, and they decide to help him. This is also the moment that Usopp himself becomes a Straw Hat, although, well, he doesn't quite know it yet. Back at the mansion, Kaya has ordered a gift for Clahador, her faithful butler. Glasses that are properly fitted to him, that won't slip down on his face anymore. It's an expensive and extremely thoughtful gift, and a show of trust and care from Kaya. When Kuro finds it, he crushes the glasses on the ground in a moment of supreme pettiness and finally reveals his villainous nature. He turns on his fellow butler Mary and nearly murders him, reasoning that his crew are going to attack the village in the morning and the time for charades is over. From here, shonen manga shenanigans ensue. A comedy of error sees each of the Straw Hats arriving late to the battle with the pirates, Zoro fights some cat-themed mini-bosses, Luffy does his first gum gum gatling, and chaos generally reigns until Kuro arrives at the beach, enraged that his perfect plan of attack has not been followed. Kaya, meanwhile, discovers Mary's wounded body and follows Kuro to the beach hoping to talk him out of his attack, willing to give him all of her wealth if he will just leave the village in peace. Kuro again refuses, stating, as he will do many times, that his plans are perfect and must be followed, and he plans to inherit Kaya's wealth legitimately to settle down into a new identity with it. His plan, it turns out, includes also murdering the entirety of his own crew, who he casually starts to kill while fighting Luffy simply because they are inconvenient and in the way. He expresses his belief that a true pirate captain uses his crew like things, like game pieces on a board. And Luffy, as you might imagine, politely disagrees with that. He rocks Kuro's entire sh** with a truly brutal gum gum bell, while Usopp takes out Django before he can hurt Kaya. As he falls, defeated, Kuro's crooked glasses fall to the ground, shattered and broken at last. After the battle, the story resolves in a fairly idyllic manner. Usopp joins the Straw Hats, Kaya gives them the going merry to Ceylon, and as the characters in Syrup Village look optimistically towards the future, the Straw Hat crew sails onwards to the next adventure. Now, on the surface, this is a serviceable, if unexceptional, One Piece story arc. It has some problems, the art is occasionally rather scuffed, like this shot of Zoro facing down one of the Nyanban brothers, for example. Like, what's going on with the perspective here? What size is anything relative to anything else? And good god, what's that fly swatted pose? Similarly, the exposition and the backstory is delivered yeah, rather clumsily in this arc. The story grinds to a screeching halt multiple times for poorly paced flashbacks, or else characters monologue things they both already know know out loud to one another for no good goddamn reason. 
Usopp's backstory, a rather important part of his characterization, is essentially slapped on near the end to give him some extra pathos in hindsight in a way that just doesn't interact very well with the rest of the story arc at all. While Kuro's first mate, the peculiar Michael Jackson parody Django, went on to get an entire sub-narrative in a dedicated series of cover stories in later One Piece volumes, Kuro himself has never in 25 years been mentioned, referenced, or even had a cameo anywhere in the story. The movies and the anime have called back to him very occasionally, I think, as a little Easter egg, but for the most part, he has just been forgotten and his story arc along with it. The Syrup Village arc is, in my experience, mostly considered a forgettable chapter of One Piece, whose primary relevance is that it's the moment that Usopp and the Going Merry showed up, but which is otherwise considered mostly unimportant. So what do I see in it? Well, to start with, let's examine the relationships that it portrays. Kuro is planning to murder Kaya the entire time. From the moment they meet, that is his objective. Not because he holds any particular malice towards her, not because she's wronged him in any way, but because it is simply convenient for him to use her corpse as a means to get the money and power that he wants. In order to do that, though, he has to establish a relationship with her, a relationship of apparent care. When Kaya's parents die, accidentally, it wasn't even Kuro's doing, and when she becomes ill, Kuro takes care of her. Not necessarily in a particularly good faith way, but he does care for her health, tend to her meals, fetch her medicine, change her sheets, and all the other things that a butler is supposed to do. He makes himself indispensable to her, important to her. He turns himself into her support system. And once he holds that position, he uses it to isolate her. He drives away the other villagers, he drives away Kaya's friends, and he uses his position as caretaker as a means to control her life. He makes her ever more dependent on him, and only him, and ever less able to seek support from any other source. Despite this toxicity, though, despite the negative impact of his controlling behavior, Kuro is seen by the people of the village as a good, kind, self-sacrificing, upstanding, and respectable gentleman, a pillar of his community, a synonym for trustworthiness and moral righteousness. Even Kaya believes that Kuro is who he presents himself to be, and she responds to his care with affection and genuine appreciation. Having lost her parents, Kuro is more or less the closest thing she has to a father, and she seeks his approval along those lines. At the same time, though, she also feels stifled by him, and does seem to correctly perceive that Kuro's behavior is controlling and smothering. Kuro manages this suspicion and deflects it by rolling out his tragic backstory, his fake history that makes him look good, insisting over and over again that he only wants what's best for her, that's why he's doing all of this. Now, changing tax for a second, in One Piece, the world is under the governance and protection of the world government, a supreme system of authority under whom the marines serve as the military power. The world government's only mission is to protect the people. Everything they do is for the sake of peace and stability and justice, absolute justice, as Fleet Admiral Sakasuki will eventually declare. And yes, sometimes their laws can be a bit stifling and controlling, but it's all for the people's own good. And if you look at history, you will see that the world government has only ever acted to protect the poor and vulnerable citizens of the world from the abuse and predation of those filthy, nasty pirates. But what a coincidence it is that much like Kuro, the world government has made up a fake version of history which justifies their actions and their authority. What a coincidence it is that much like Kaya, the civilian people of One Piece correctly perceive that the world government's rule is abusive and toxic, but find themselves powerless to do anything about it because they're also dependent on the world government for care and protection. And what a coincidence it is that the world government has set itself up as respectable, as trusted, as upstanding, law-abiding, and honorable while smearing the pirates who exist outside of its authority as lawless, untrustworthy, dangerous liars, just like Kuro does to Usopp. What a coincidence it is that much like how Kuro uses other people as things and objects for his own benefit, the celestial dragons who run the world government enslave and brutalize the civilian population with impunity, whilst declaring that their orders must simply be followed, 
do not dare to ask why. Now, it's not so much that I think Kuro's treatment of Kaya is necessarily meant to be a metaphor for the corruption of the world government, but rather that these patterns and relationships reflect a common theme in One Piece. Namely, that the people who clothe themselves in respectability, authority, purity, and law to justify their use and abuse of power are the most dishonest, the most cruel, the most abusive, and the most selfish people of all. Which leads us naturally on to a discussion of... Captain Kuro is a liar who pretends to be an honest man, and Usopp is an honest man who pretends to be a liar. This is a dynamic that, despite the sometimes clunky execution, makes Kuro a perfect villain for Usopp's introduction. Usopp appears cowardly and selfish a lot of the time, but would in fact rather die than let down the people he cares about, and he's willing to tell any lie, however outrageous, if it will make Kaya smile or protect his village. Meanwhile, Kuro will never tell anyone, even his own crew, the truth, unless it serves only his interests, and he never takes any action except that it benefits him personally. They are mirrors of each other in this way, opposites in conflict, and when Kuro provokes Usopp into attacking him, he does it specifically by baiting him to lie about his heritage and his past. Usopp would never, ever do this, but Kuro does it all the time. And much in the same way that the relationship between Kuro and Kaya can be read as an extension of the series' themes about abuse of power, so too can the relationship between Kuro and Usopp be read as an extension of the themes of lies versus truth and respectability versus morality. Usopp is not a respectable young man. He's the son of a pirate, a habitual prankster, and a casual liar who spends his days making trouble and being a nuisance. He's not respectable, but he is moral. He's a good person who is willing, instinctively, to put his life on the line to protect other people. He constantly puts other people's needs ahead of his own, even when it is of no benefit to him. The villagers chase him out when he tries to warn them about the pirates. They shout abuse at him, and one of them even shoots and wounds him. And still, though no one will believe him and nobody is likely to thank him, Usopp takes on the Black Cat Pirates. And when the Straw Hats win, Usopp is the one who insists that they keep it all a secret, because it is ultimately more important to him that the village has its peace of mind than to have them celebrate him as a hero. Kuro, by contrast, curates his respectability very carefully as a tactic. He does everything he can to put on the airs of someone trustworthy, someone moral, someone honorable, while his every actual action is purely self-serving. To him, morality is only useful as a shield against suspicion. It's an appearance that you put on to further your own agenda. And if Kuro thus reflects the values and behavior of the world government, which also uses a rhetoric of respectability to veil its authoritarianism, then Usopp reflects the values of a true pirate. Joy, fun, solidarity, kindness, and freedom. Usopp and indeed all of the Straw Hats are flawed, but they are honest in those flaws, while Kuro and the world government put on disguises of purity and uncompromising moral perfection to help them commit abuse. And since we're on the subject of disguises and appearances, that would be a really great segue into a discussion of character design, but first I'm afraid I have to do a little bit of self-promotion. Yeah, sorry to interrupt the video, but I do want to give a thank you and a shout out to my supporters on Patreon who make these videos possible. I fully expect that this video will do rather poorly for me, at least on the numbers. It's not my usual subject matter, so it's not what most people are subscribed for. The algorithm does not know me as an anime or manga channel, so it probably won't recommend this video very broadly. And the part of One Piece I decided to talk about is unpopular and over 25 years old, so literally nobody's going to be excited and searching for video essays about it. I've sunk a lot of labor hours into making this video, but once the ad revenue comes in, I'm probably going to be making a lot less than minimum wage for my time. Time, which is where Patreon comes in. If you enjoy videos like this, and if you want to help me be able to make videos on more niche or unpopular subjects in the future, then you can sign up for a monthly donation on Patreon, or give a one-time tip on Coffee instead, if you prefer. Those donations come with some rewards, including access to my Discord server and early access to my videos before anyone else gets to see them. A single dollar donation means the same as thousands of monetized views on a video. It makes so much more of a difference than it might seem. So if you have a creator whose work you enjoy, whether that's me or someone else, consider supporting them directly when you can with whatever you can. 
If you're not in a position to be able to do that though, or you just don't want to, you absolutely do not have to. It is enough that you've watched the video this far, and I appreciate your time. Anyway, sorry for the interruption, let's talk about some good goddamn character design. Captain Kuro, as a character design, has to serve two functions. On the one hand, he needs to look like Plahador, a seemingly dependent, serious-minded, caretaking butler who's an upstanding pillar of his community. He needs to look enough like that, at the very least, that the characters in the story can be plausibly fooled by him, and preferably also the audience, even if only for a little while. On the other hand, he also needs to look like a scheming, conniving, black-hearted, calculating chess master villain, and although the audience shouldn't take him for a bad guy, immediately, we should definitely feel at least some antipathy towards him from the start. So what does Oda do to solve this design problem? Well, in one of his less subtle moves of all time, he draws literal piles of shit on Kuro's butler uniform. Which, well, that's juvenile, first of all. It's a very literal way to say, hey, this is a shitty person, ha ha ha. But much though I kind of hate to admit it, it also kind of works. It's disarming. Along with his weird curly collar, the literal poop on his shirt makes him look silly, quite literally silly. It undercuts any sense of real menace that the man might have. It makes him look like a socially intolerant dickhead with a stick up his ass, like an antagonist, but not a cold-hearted serial killer. Now, there are subtler ways to play with silliness and seriousness to define a character's vibe than literally drawing poop on them, and Oda will play with those ways later in the series. Think of Big Mom's homies or Moria Gecko's entire character design. But unsubtle and juvenile though it is, it does work at least for Kuro's character design. Something else that also works is the color coding. Kaya's mansion is an almost purely white space, and she herself is blonde and wears a white nightgown. The walls of the mansion are white, the furniture is white, and there are barely any shadows in there. Kaya is a classic pure maiden archetype, specifically a little bit of a Rapunzel, the way that she's stuck in her room. So this airy brightness in her environment helps character design for her. It helps her look innocent and pure and uncorrupted. There are no shadows in her room except for one. Kuro is introduced this way, literally as a shadow, a dark figure hovering in Kaya's room behind her, and every time they interact, he cuts a dramatic contrast with her. Now, this is not to suggest that any instance of solid black in the series denotes darkness or evil. It's a black and white manga. Solid black is used all the time. Mary, for example, who's unequivocally a good guy, also wears black. So it's not that any instance of white means purity and goodness and any instance of black means evil. Just that in the specific relationship between Kaya and Kuro, that is the connotation that this contrast takes on. Similarly, it should be noted that Mary also has a very different shape language than Kuro. Since he is a... I don't know what he is, a sheep person? His face is nothing but curves and soft angles. Fluffy hair, round eyes, his mouth and nose are defined by these rounded, wavy swoops. Mary is made of almost nothing but curves and soft shapes. Kuro's face, by contrast, is almost nothing but angles and sharp lines. His slicked back hair, his jawline, his long forehead, and his temples, his sharp nose, it all gives the impression of someone who is altogether sharper in character and more prickly, which again also helps build the contrast between Kuro and the soft-featured Kaya. These sharp features also character design for his other side. High temples and a large forehead are the stereotypical design coding of intellectualism, and in the same way that a feminine character pulling their hair tight into a bun is often visual coding for being uptight, Kuro's sleeked back hair with not a strand out of place gives that vibe of control, a controlled hairstyle, a controlled image. Compare and contrast with Mary, as we've mentioned, but also with Kaya and her soft, wavy, undone hair, or Usopp with that big, curly, wild mop on his head. And of course, when Kuro is defeated, when his control is broken, one of the things that happens to him visually to signify this is that his hair gets all messed up as he falls. So, overlooking the poop on his jacket, Kuro is actually a very well-made character design, able to fill both the role of Clahador and Captain of the Black Cat Pirates extremely well. The most important part of Kuro's character design, though, and I did give the game away a little bit with the title of this section, are his glasses, specifically because of what the glasses represent. 
As a character design feature, glasses are obviously stereotypically coding for this person is smart. They are associated with reading, with learning, and so on. If you want a character to look like a thinky thinky smart guy, you give him glasses. But glasses are also about vision, both literally and semiotically. Their purpose is to allow a person to see the world, and they are the thing the person sees the world through. In a literal sense, they are a person's perspective. Much much, much later in One Piece, in the Dressrosa arc, Luffy fights Don Quixote do Flamingo, and one of his very prominent character design features are the sunglasses he always wears. He wears them as a child, when he's already a horrid little monster, and he wears them as an adult, when he's even worse, and they are contorted into the stereotypical shape of evil eyes. Doflamingo has a profoundly twisted and evil view of the world, seeing himself as an inherently superior, godlike being to whom all others must naturally bow. Much like Kuro, Doflamingo is a control freak, a chess master, literally dancing everyone else on his puppet strings. Like Kuro, he uses other human beings as objects for his own benefit. So when Luffy beats Doflamingo with a King Kong gun, Oda takes special care to show the glasses being shattered to show them falling to the ground beside him, as a visual metaphor that Luffy hasn't just defeated the man, the villain, he has defeated his worldview, his way of seeing things. This is also why when Doflamingo shows up later imprisoned in Impel Down, the glasses are right back on his face, we never get to see his eyes beneath them, because he refuses to give up his way of seeing the world. He sees the world through a darkened perspective, always. Captain Kuro's glasses keep slipping off his nose, and he keeps having to readjust them. Oda calls attention to this gesture many times over the course of the chapters, with Django, in one memorable moment, saying that Kuro's peculiar habit of adjusting the glasses with his palm is a habit developed from wearing his claw gloves, and that this way of adjusting his glasses is a result of his violent bloodlust. It's proof that he remembers how to kill. And despite their deficiency, Kuro is oddly attached to those ill-fitting glasses. When he finds that Kaya has sent away for a special order of a pair of glasses that will actually fit him, that won't slide off his face all the time, he shatters them brutally, rejecting them as an insult, even though they are, objectively, better than what he was already wearing. He's planning to rob her, he's planning to take everything she owns, and yet for some reason he refuses to take the very useful gift of a better pair of glasses. Even when Kuro is fighting Luffy, and his glasses are cracked and the lenses are broken well beyond the point where the glasses are even remotely useful, he keeps the frames on his face, adjusting them back there. So the glasses aren't just a useful item to him, they aren't just a matter of utility, they mean something here. Accepting Kaya's replacement glasses would have meant something, taking his glasses off when they're broken would have meant something. It is not until Luffy finally beats him, and delivers the final blow with the gum gum bell, that Kuro's glasses finally fall off his face, bent and broken. And like he will do later with Doflamingo, Oda makes a point of showing them here, in the foreground, clattering to the ground with a tink to symbolize the defeat of the villain. The glasses are Kuro's perspective. They are, thematically, his view of the world. He believes that he alone matters, that he alone to serve to control the people around him, and that all other things are expendable towards that goal. And more than that, as he screams right before Luffy knocks him out, he believes, down to the marrow of his bones, that his plans are perfect, they cannot fail, and they must be followed. But Kuro's perspective is also unstable. He keeps having to adjust things to make it fit. He entered service in Kaya's mansion, but then her parents died and she took ill, and neither of those things were part of his plan. So he adjusted, he changed the plan to fit the circumstances. He wanted to isolate and control Kaya, but Usopp keeps finding a way in to make friends with her, so he has to adjust the plan. He meets Django in a private place to discuss their plans, but he chose a spot beneath literally Usopp's most favorite hangout spot in the village, which he might have known if he had paid attention. So he gets overheard, and he has to adjust the plan. He lets Usopp go, because surely nobody will ever believe such a well-known liar, but then someone does believe him and he has to adjust the plan. He tries to murder Mary, but Mary survives and then Kaya shows up at the beach and so he has to adjust the plan. Every single time Kuro lays a perfect, perfect plan in this arc, some part of it goes wrong and he has to adjust and adjust and adjust and adjust and no matter how wrong the plan goes, he insists that it is still perfect and that it's everyone else's fault for not following his instructions. 
The irony, of course, is that his belief in the supremacy of his plans, his misplaced faith in that unstable perspective, is the thing that leads to his downfall. It causes him to underestimate people constantly. He underestimates Mary, who survives his attack. He underestimates Usopp, who manages to get people to believe him and help defend the village. He underestimates Kaya, who pushes herself beyond her own limits in a determination to stop him. He underestimates the village kids, who keep foiling Django. And he underestimates Luffy, who rocks his entire sh** for making that mistake. All of this makes the moment that he crushes the gift from Kaya extra interesting. Thematically, this is a moment of potential reconciliation. Kaya and Clahador have been in conflict, but Kaya has sent away for a very nice anniversary present, in part as an olive branch for their relationship between them. It's an offer of kindness and friendship and gratitude from her, even in spite of their strained relationship. And the thing is, Kuro's stated plan, his objective, is to live a peaceful life with access to wealth. All he would reasonably have to do to get that would be to stick out the butler gig a few more years, order Django to hypnotize the black cats and himself to forget about their captain, and then just ask Kaya for more money. She's naive, innocent, and generous to an absolute fault. She would have given it to him. He could have stuck out a cushy, do-nothing head butler job, getting Kaya to hire other people to do all the work, and retired with a fat wallet and no obligations. But in order to do that, he would have to accept Kaya's gift he would have had to adopt a different perspective. And Kuro can't do that. He doesn't understand cooperation or generosity or even really family or friendship. He only understands other people as things for him to use, as objects. The idea of being of service to someone, of having a relationship of trust and care, putting someone else's needs first, the concept of seeing anyone as an equal, you know, all the things that the Straw Hats do so casually. To him, that is debasement and humiliation. It's an assault on his dignity. So when Kaya's gift of glasses symbolically offers him a different way to see the world, even though it's better, even though it's more stable, he rejects it violently because holding on to his perspective, his presumption of superiority matters to him even more than actually getting what he says he wants. Villains in One Piece do this over and over again. They proclaim superiority. They dictate the terms of the world to other people. They invent ideologies and hierarchies over and over again, all of it to cover up for a much simpler and uglier motivation. They crave power, authority, and control over other people. And all of their schemes and plans, whatever rhetoric they paint on top of that, are ultimately about that. It is not the only villain motivation in One Piece, but it is a pretty important one, and it is the animating impulse of the entire world government who might be the biggest villains in the entire story. Kuro may be often forgotten nowadays. His arc is a bit scuffed, his plot is a little bit simple, his exposition is rather ham-fisted, and his story arc is just generally rough around the edges. But he is a prototype of an incredibly important kind of villain in One Piece, and I think he deserves to be remembered more. If nothing else, I will die on the hill that Captain Kuro's glasses are a genuinely brilliant piece of character design, and the way that they're used in his story are a genuinely fantastic piece of comic book craftsmanship. <laughs> There are a lot of amazing scenes I could show you to tell you why I love One Piece. But if you were to ask me why I love rereading One Piece, I think Syrup Village is the arc I'll point to. It is not well loved, it is never referenced later in the story, Captain Kuro is a forgotten and forgettable villain, and yet so much of what I love about the series begins here. I didn't notice the character design trick of Captain Kuro's glasses the first time around, nor did I catch that the relationships between Kuro, Kaya, and Usopp foreshadow and develop themes that will be expanded later. I didn't notice that there's a parallel between the intimate personal abuse of authority that Kuro commits and the structural society-wide abuse of authority that the world government does. But going back to it and finding that even in this early, scuffed, not very well-constructed period of One Piece's history, when the art was inconsistent and the storytelling was sometimes stilted and the characters were a bit arch and shallow, even here, One Piece has a remarkable clarity of theme and idea. That 
is really rewarding as a reader. One Piece, whatever else you can say about it, is a story that knows what it is about. It has a clear vision and a standpoint, both morally and politically, which it has pursued with relentless determination for over 25 years. And that is goddamn impressive. And look, I don't blame anyone who looks at almost 22,000 pages of comic or over 1,000 anime episodes and gets put off by that. I don't blame anyone who looks at the exaggerated cartoon art style and finds it too silly or childish for their tastes. But if you have the time, one day, if any of what we've discussed in this video sounds interesting to you, pick up a couple of volumes, read it until, oh, say, maybe Arlong Park, and see if maybe it doesn't grab you. Because if it does, oh, my friend, you are in for a hell of a ride. And that's a video, I guess. Hi, welcome to the post-video ramble segment. Um, I've been reading One Piece, I've been rereading One Piece, rather, for like the 15th time because I'm making shorts about it over on the Shorts channel, and yeah, I ended up noticing a bunch of stuff in the early parts of One Piece that I just really wanted to talk about, so now this video exists. I, I don't do a lot of anime or manga videos generally because they're just so vulnerable to copyright strikes, and that scares the hell out of me because this this is like, I pay my rent with this channel and if it goes away, I'm in trouble. Um, but One Piece is just, it's a really important story to me. It's a manga that I have read for most of my natural life, which is fucking weird to say out loud, and I really needed to talk about some of the things I find brilliant about it. So uh, if you've enjoyed this video, maybe hit up my shorts channel and check out the over 40 shorts I've made over there discussing the best panels of the One Piece manga and why they're good. They don't, they don't get a lot of love in the algorithm either, but I'm quite proud of them and I would love for more people to see them. Thank you to Shannon Strucci, by the way, who helped me proofread this script. Their feedback was very helpful and you can find a link to their channel in the description down below. They have a great essay about what One Piece has meant to them too and you should check it out. Outside of that, uh, subscribe to my Let's Play channel. Hey, why not? Uh, follow me on Twitch, maybe. I'm playing Final Fantasy 16 over there right now, and I'm probably going to get into Baldur's Gate 3 uh, sometime soon, maybe after it drops. So if you want to follow along with any of that, hey, stop on by. I would love to have your company. I have one more non-traditional video for my channel that I'm working on right now. That'll probably be the next one after the Boss Designs episode. And after that... I'm probably going to have to bite the bullet and get back to doing some League of Legends videos because, I'm not going to lie, I am feeling the consequences of straying outside of my algorithm-assigned box. Uh, like, it's not too bad, but like I, I can see that the views are, like, sinking and the ad revenue is going along with it. And, you know, again, have to pay my rent, so... Ugh. But, uh, how about an arcane animation breakdown? Would that be... would that be of interest to anyone? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to be kind to one another. Have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourselves. And may the tides of history wash gently over us all.